Melissa. My name is Patrick Milas, and I am the CE Consultant here at the Bureau of Library Development. Welcome, everyone, and it's my pleasure to introduce Jana Fine, our Youth Services Consultant. Jana. Thank you, Patrick. Um, happy lunchtime, everyone. Um, I hope that you're able to um, enjoy the webinar and uh, enjoy your lunchtime as well. Um, we have a great webinar for you today. I'm very excited about it. Um, I met this person about a year and a half ago, or maybe two years, when we were touring with workshops at, in Jacksonville, and we toured the youth department there, which is pretty incredible, by the way. And um, Susan Mankiewicz was there, and she talked about what she did, and I was so thoroughly impressed that it stuck with me in the back of my head. So that when it came time this summer for me to talk about early literacy and the importance of um, all the different aspects of early literacy, I immediately thought of Susan, and I'm so very happy that she's with us today, and I'd like to present Susan Mankiewicz, who's our early learning specialist at the Jacksonville Public Library. Welcome, Susan. Thank you so much. And hello, everybody. I'm very excited to be here today uh, to talk about our story times and the importance of early childhood um, and what we do with its impact on our families. Uh, this is Head, Shoulders, Knees, and Toes, Story Times and Early Childhood Research. I named that specifically not just to get that uh, song stuck in your head for the rest of the day, um, but to also emphasize that uh, story times are very interactive and it is a full body experience. And we're going to talk about the research um, that speaks to why that's Let's get started. So again, my name is Susan Mankowski. Um, I I have my master's in education from the University of Florida, um, where I specialized in uh, children's literature and psychology, so I didn't specialize. Um, I'm currently the early childhood specialist here at the Jacksonville Public Library, and my focus is ages from zero to eight years of age, uh, child development, early literacy, and early learning. I do a lot of training for our uh, professional development training for our staff, in addition to um, doing uh, professional development for preschool teachers of the school system, and then also going out and talking to parents as well. Three, I have three objectives for today. Um, my first objective is why do we even do story times? As a library, this is our most important program, or probably one of our most, it is our most popular program. Um, so. It's not just a place for parents to come in that's free and air-conditioned and entertainment, and it's definitely more significant than just reading books to children. All of our literacy programs are grounded in research that address specific activities and skills that very young children need to succeed, and we're going to go over some of that research today. Um, so what is a story time then? Well, you may or may not be familiar with our pre-literacy skills, uh, and these are identified as essential skills children need to be able to be proficient readers and writers when they start school. So we're going to talk about how do we incorporate those pre literacy skills into our story time, and then also what other components do they need to have in place to be successful, not in school, but also in life. And then also, if we have them for such a limited amount of time, what do we need to have to make the most of the story time experience for our family? How do we make the most of you guys ready? All right, here we go. Why do we do a story time? Well, the, to give a little bit of background on brain research and, um, and brain development, our brain, when we're born, has all the neurons that we'll have for the rest of our life. Um, actually, we have more, so uh, because they'll actually die off later on through a process called pruning. But when we're born, um, just before birth and at birth, we um, our brain starts rapidly developing. So in the first year of life, our brain actually doubles in size. And by age three, we're actually 80% of the volume that we'll have, have as an adult. So our first three years of life are essential in brain development um, and setting up our, our, our brain for future learning, interaction, social competency, everything. So a synapse is kind of like your, it's where your brain fires, and it builds what's called a neuropathway. And that pathway is how information is received and categorized in our brain. So the more opportunities we have for our brains to activate, and they activate through experience, um, the stronger those neural pathways will be. 
this was explained to me when, um, once when I, I feel this is a kind of a really good example. If you and I were sitting on a, a lawn, we were sitting outside, and we had a ball, and I roll the ball to you, and you roll the ball back to me, and we roll the ball back and forth and back and forth, eventually we're going to develop a rut in the grass, right? But there's an action that's involved. There's an action. I'm pushing it to you, you're pushing it to me, and we're going to develop this rut. But if we get up and walk away, within no time, the rut um, that we've created will actually grow over. And that's the process, um, briefly, is kind of the process of what synapses do in neural pathways. The more we use them, the stronger they'll be and the, and the stronger impact we'll have. Um, if we stop using those neural pathways, they'll actually be in a way. Um, make the brain more efficient. Uh, so as you see here, the Center for Developing Child through um, Harvard University has an incredible, they're just a incredible wealth of knowledge. They have this uh, program called In Brief, that I, um, which is YouTube videos that I highly recommend. But I want you to take a look at this. On the left third of your screen, where it says um, conception to birth, that's before we're born. So at three, before three months, you know, three months before we're born, you see there's a, a, actually a, a spike in, um, in the um, brain development when it comes to vision and hearing, uh, so our sensory pathways. And then also, right at birth, it happens again. Um, and then our language, look at that blue line. The blue line also uh, very much spikes. And then our red line of higher cognitive function also is steady progress. So if you look, the next section, that middle third, is the first year of life. And if you can see, they all, the brain is spiking in all areas, sensory, language, and higher cognitive functioning by the, just that first year of life. We're, um, we're building those neural pathways very quickly. Yeah. And hey, then Susan, by, sorry. Yes? Susan, this is Melissa. Your sound is really going in and out. Are you having any bandwidth uh, issues at your library today? Um, maybe. I mean, we're very busy, so if everybody's on right now. We, okay. Because there's times yeah. when your sound is fine, and there's other times where it just is, is not listenable, um, and folks are complaining. Um, do, you, are, do you have a phone near you? I do have a phone. Okay. On the audio tab, if you click telephone, it'll give you instructions to call in. I think that we should definitely do that, because it's I don't know that people are going to be able to get anything out of it if they can't hear you. Okay. I apologize. I'll, I'll do that right now. Okay. okay. And I, I'm going to apologize, um, because I really messed up your name. I don't know what I was thinking. I was reading and introducing at the same time, which is something I should never do again in my life. Um, but um, Susan Mankowski um, is a, a fabulous person. And if you ever get a chance to visit the Jacksonville Public Library, uh, you really need to take a tour of the youth department because it, it's pretty spectacular. Um, they've done a lot of thought about how children enter. There's a, a puppet theater room that is, well, I can't explain it to you. You'd have to go through it. Um, but I know that in visiting around Florida that I've been so terribly impressed with a lot of libraries, not just Jacksonville's, but, um, but Susan is our guest speaker today. So I'm praising her and her surroundings. So anyway, but I think that all of you have incredible places and do incredible works, which um, is, is great. And Susan, I see that you're getting connected. Um, I don't know if you can hear us yet, but you're going to have to put in an audio pin in order to unmute. So I'm just going to take thanks for everyone for bearing with us while we get Susan's audio switched over so that you guys can hear. And I've got one more. I've got a story. I know Lisa's on. Um, can um, Lisa, can you unmute yourself, or can we unmute her? Can do it. Lisa, are you there? Go ahead, Lisa. Lisa, go ahead. I don't know if she's got a microphone. Um, if you don't have a microphone, that's okay. I'm going to relate the story because it's really kind of funny. Funny, good, I guess. Okay. Um, Susan, can you talk now? Okay, let me see if I can. I don't hear you yet. Okay, try now. How about now? Can you hear yes. me now? Oh my gosh, it's so sorry everybody. As you know, it doesn't matter how many times we practice <laughs> if um, yeah, our broadband isn't great. So yay, you can hear me, you can hear me. Um, wonderful, okay. So 
So I'm going to go back. I'm sorry. Did I interrupt a story? Go ahead. No, uh, that's okay. Okay. We want to hear um, you. I'm, I'm, okay, good. Well, I'm going to go ahead and um, just kind of review then. I, I'm not sure where I really got lost in the in the shuffle. So I'm just going to go back to the human brain development, um, this chart that you see in front of you, uh, where we have our sensory pathways, our language, and our higher cognitive function all really spike at birth. Um, so the left uh, panel, like third, is um, conception to birth, and as you see from three months, and then at birth, look at the spike, especially in our sensory pathways of vision and hearing. And then within the first year, which is the middle panel, um, our language spikes about seven and eight months, and that's about the time when we're uh, really starting to try to speak. Um, they did this uh, fantastic study where um, the, our language and the sounds that we make at birth are same no matter where we are in the world. So um, whether I'm born in China, if I'm born in the United States, if I'm born in Spain, if I'm born in Russia, it doesn't matter. The sounds I make from at birth are the same no matter where I'm born. About six months of age, our vocalizations will actually change to mimic more the sound of the language that we're going to be speaking, our prominent language, which is incredible. And if you look and see that blue line actually very much um, uh, follows that, that about seven to eight months of age, we have a huge language spike. Um, which means we're really picking up all this language and we're getting ready to actually use it. And then by the first year of age, you see we're, um, we're really still, uh, which is the past third panel, now our higher cognitive functioning brain part is developing, um, which is our higher thinking skills, our, um, our trying to interact with others, and our more of our impact on our environment, our world around us. We're going to talk a lot more about that today and how really learning is a, a back and forth, it's a give and take, where I, um, I work on and interact with my environment and then the response I get is actually uh, what's important. So yes, so that's the brain development. The next one that I have here um, also kind of goes, parallels the language that we were talking about in the, in the first slide. Um, does anybody remember the baby Einstein recalls of 2009? This was in response to a study that Wake Forest released in June of 2007, um, where they were um, they had children at, that were 24 months and younger that they would show a video to, and they then would ask the kids afterwards if they could identify specific um, vocabulary based on the video that they saw, and then they basically did the same thing, but in in person with another group of kids. So it was a live action where there was a researcher and a group of children or they were watching a video. And at this point in time, it's actually Teletubbies, which I think is very funny. Um, and then they afterwards said, okay, how much vocabulary are they learning from this, um, from this experience? Well, they found that it was, I mean, it was huge the difference between whether it was a direct interaction or whether it was a screen interaction. Um, and then they also then videotaped themselves and said, okay, well, I mean, it's Teletubbies. So they videotaped themselves and said, what does it look like if um, I do the same thing and I'm just on a screen or versus face-to-face? -face? And while it was a little better from the screen, it, it, wasn't, it was still significant, the one-on-one -on -one interaction with these children, two and under. And it was such a definitive research um, result that Disney, who owns Baby Einstein at the time, or who owns Baby Einstein, actually recalled their videos and their DVDs. And beforehand, they were basically selling these that this is a way to educate your child. And now, if you look at the DVDs, it says basically you need to interact with your child, that these are a supplemental educational component that is actually the parent that needs to be sitting there and interacting with their child because that is how the child is learning. Um, and like I said, in 2009, they, they even uh, recalled these Baby Einstein videos um, so that they could change the, the verbiage on their packaging. Um, and again, in 2014, the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, again confirmed and did a recommendation that children under the age of two um, should not even be limited, but avoid television or screen time at this point in time. Um, so it just goes back to, while it doesn't matter what we have, whether it's a book, it's a screen, it's a, you know, your tablet, your phone, your toys, you're the important component in the interaction. Um, that everything else is just a tool for your interaction with the child. It's the communication and the, and the language experience that's happening that's more important. 
In addition, Hart and Risley then expanded, and they um, uh, released a paper called The Early Catastrophe, The 30 Million Word Gap by Age 3. Um, and this is, there's a lot of information out here, and by no means are these research studies exhaustive. Please go out and, and, and um, do your own. There's, there's tons of research out there that talks about the importance of early language experiences with children. And this one was fascinating because they followed children, um, they followed families, not just children, they followed families in varying socioeconomic backgrounds monthly until the children were three years of age. So they would go out monthly, they would sit in um, while families were interacting, and then they would observe, record, and transcribe uh, the interactions that they found with each of the families. And after this multi-year interaction and study, they combined all the research, and they, there's some very interesting findings. Um, they found that 86% of the words recorded by children by age three, so at age three, 86% of the words recorded by children were also a part of their parents' vocabulary, which, I mean, we think, well, of course, they're just little mimics, right? So they're listening to their parents, and then they're just saying back what they hear. And that was true, 80% 86% of the words were the same. Also, by age three, the child's talking, vocabulary growth, and interactions were clearly established, meaning how I talk to somebody else, um, the type of vocabulary that I use, was already established by age three. So we want to make sure that we're having um, conversations with children um, that, and giving them an opportunity to voice their thoughts and they're also their concerns, their needs, their questions, things like that. There was also, and this is why it's called the 30 million word gap, there was between the low income families and the middle income families a 30 million word gap. So that means the number of words heard by those youngest of children um, between middle and income, there was 30 million word difference. And it's not like these low income children are then gonna turn three and they're gonna hear a lot more or they're gonna start school and they're gonna catch up. They're already behind 30 million words and just hearing of what's going on. And then in addition, it just wasn't the words, but it was the variety of vocabulary and language that was heard that was significant. So between a low income family and a middle income family, it was um, a, a lot more of like, no, stop, sit down, come here, versus what do you think about this? So those children who are now gonna start school when a teacher or comes to your library and you ask a question, they don't necessarily know how to respond because they've never had that practice. And the, the troubling portion of this is their now communication style is already fixed at age three. So we wanna make sure that we're offering a lot of um, conversational opportunities for young children. And then the Carlson and Cheryl research study, I, this is one of nearest and dearest to my heart. The conditions that promote a love of reading, which is what we're ultimately trying to do, um, we wanna make sure that we're offering these services to our youngest of children so that we are um, building this lifelong um, opportunity for, for people to come at any stage of their life for learning and reading opportunities, right? Well, what do we need to do then? We need to have a freedom of choice and reading material. More and more, our kids, they go to school and it's a reading list, or you'll hear your parents come in to you and say, so do you have a reading list this summer? Um, or no, I can't have that, that's not on my child's school reading list. And that's very troubling um, because it doesn't challenge the child uh, and there's it kind of diminishes their their interest in wanting to read or that they have a choice in reading selection so freedom of choice and reading material is very important especially during the summer months availability of books and magazines this uh, study is a little bit dated that would also include at this point in time availability of books magazines audiobooks uh, movies, um, uh, computer games, apps, things like that, and that's definitely for children three and up. Um, so a, a broad variety of materials for them to be able to check out. Family members who read aloud and adults and peers who model reading. So if we want our children to be capable readers, then we want to make sure that they're having the opportunity to see others reading, because what other adults are doing is what a child feels is, is important. Um, so if I'm on my phone all day, then that child wants the phone. 
if I'm reading, then the child wants my book. If I'm on the computer, then the child wants to be on the computer. They're just mimicking the behaviors of the adults that they see. So if we make it an active um, a part of our conversation with them where you're saying, um, what are you reading? Are you enjoying that? Um, this is what I'm reading right now. And you let them see that this is something that you enjoy, uh, then it will also become important to them. It's not just about reading the books, but it's also equally important to discuss the book afterwards. So not just like, wasn't well, that a great book? Let's move on. But oh my goodness, what happened in our story? Would you do anything differently? Um, asking them to, to share their thoughts and process the information that they've just received. Owning books is very important as well. And at the library, I will say this is something that we, we, we have the book sales, you know, Friends of the Library book sales. And we do have our summer and um, winter prize books for, for reading and things like that. Um, but we do offer a lot more, um, millions more books at, at their fingertips. But having something that they can personally own and goes back to they chose that reading material, that it's there, it's, it's, um, it provides a connection to the book. And then again, of course, the, my favorite part, availability of libraries and librarians, that it's um, access to you, not just access to you, but to be able to have these conversations with you, to be able to pick your brains, um, to have you know, recommendations, and to be able to have conversation is, is what is important about this. So what is the common denominator of the research that I just shared with you? It's the interaction and engagement. That is what's important, no matter what research study, where we're talking about language, if we're talking about love of reading, if we're talking about brain development, it all boils down to interaction and engagement, um, and that they're receiving this from an interested and nurturing adult, somebody who's taking an active interest in this child and wants the best for them. Any questions about the research study, now that you can hear me? You want to mention it? And while we're waiting to see if any questions come in, um, mm -hmm. I just wanted to say that if you've got more than one person watching at a computer, if you could just type into the chat and let me know. We love it when you watch as groups. It allows you to discuss things, and um, we encourage that. But it's great for our statistics for us to know how many of you are actually on. So um, if you've got any questions, go ahead and type them into chat or raise your hand, and we'll um, unmute you, and you can ask your question. Um, while we're waiting, if people have questions, um, there's something that the Association of Library Services to Children put out late last fall uh, as an initiative campaign, and um, they're really great. They're called Babies Need Words Every Day, Talk, Read, Sing, Play, and um, I know that uh, Susan and I and got really excited about these, and um, they really kind of go along with everything that she's saying. Um, I'm sure that some of you already were aware of those, but if you're not, I would check into it. Uh, it's free. You can print a variety of different posters and brochures um, and work with um, other people throughout the community to promote um, read, reading, singing, playing, and talking to young children. And um, there's a question, is the PowerPoint of this available? We can send that out as part of the follow-up message. You'll get the PowerPoint and all the resources and a link to the recording. Any other questions? I don't think so. Carry wow, on. OK. <laughs> All right. So what does this mean for our story time? We're just going to move on to that a little bit of the research. And like I said, that was not exhaustive of the amount of research that's out there on early childhood. Um, and I do have additional links at the back that we're going to talk about. Um, but what does this mean for your story time? So if we're talking about the brain research, we're talking about um, the interactions, we're talking about our, the importance of parents, how does this translate into a story time? Um, well, as you heard, we are predisposed to learn language. Our brains are ready at birth, before birth, to be able to pick up this language and to be able to one, actively use it. And really all reading and writing is, or what we call literacy, all that is, is a way to express language. So the stronger I am in my 
um, vocabulary, the stronger I am in my communication skills, um, the stronger I am and be able to express myself and my needs and my wants and my thoughts, um, the better I'm going to be at reading and writing. And that breaks down into literacy skills. We have this kind of assumption that um, for literacy skills, that means I know my alphabet, I know the sounds they make, and I know sight words. But it, there's six preliteracy skills that are very, very important that our children need to be aware and proficient in all six of them to be a strong reader and writer. And they break down to oral language and vocabulary development, which is developing our language through talking and learning um, new vocabulary. And that starts at birth. Uh, with that child where you're talking to them and you're like, oh my gosh, look at you, welcome to the world, aren't you precious? And they're making little sounds, um, asking them a question and then waiting for their response. You're setting up the opportunity for them to say something. Now, of course, they're not. They're just going to, you know, babble or um, smile at you, but you're creating that conversation with them. And that's the beginning of our oral language and vocabulary building uh, so it starts even from infancy. The next is understanding and comprehending what's going on in the conversation or about what's happening in the text of what you're reading. That's called emergent comprehension. Um, and then that flows very nicely into um, phonological awareness. So they kind of build on themselves, oral language, going into comprehension, and now phonological awareness, which is just identifying and differentiating various sounds that are around us. So it could be what a lot of people think phonics, like letter A says A, ah, or it could be that the cow says moo, um, and it's also rhyming. So can I rhyme words together? Do I know alliteration? Can I group words together by the same beginning sound, or can I, um, if I say, you know, what's uh, our today we're going to be talking about the moon? What other words do we know that start with a mm 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 sound? Can they tell me other words that start with the letter M, um, like manatee and um, muppet and things like that? So that's also phonological awareness, that I can hear the sounds, the different variations of sound and language, and then when I am reading, um, I actually hear those sounds when I'm reading to myself as well. Can I identify and know the purpose of letters? That's letter knowledge but it's not necessarily just letters. Uh, letter knowledge is knowing and being able to di differentiate between letters, numbers, shapes, and punctuation. As a child, generally a child three and under, if they're looking at a piece of paper, it's just all squiggles. I know that there's import, but it's all just code to me. I, don't, I can't differentiate between the different things. So letter knowledge is being able to know that that is a letter and it makes a sound. Here is a number, which is a quantity. Um, here's a shape, which actually I can build things with, and this is punctuation, which actually determines how this information is going to be relayed. So is it relayed with excitement, with a question, is it just a flat statement? Um, all very important things, and the child needs to be able to identify between those, uh, those different objects on the page. That relates into print concepts. So can I actually engage and interact with printed materials, knowing that if I'm reading a recipe card or a book or if I'm reading a magazine, that the format may change, but the concept of print does not change. That stays the same. I'm in, in English, we read from left to right, top to bottom, and that's not going to change depending on how I'm engaging a poster or if I'm engaging a menu. It doesn't matter. I'm still going to read in that in that form and that way. Um, also that there's an author and an illustrator that actually tell, that wrote the story. It's not just me standing up there um, making it up as I go along, that there's an actual legitimate author and illustrator who wrote and created these stories. Um, and then how do I turn the pages? Um, where do I start reading on the book? These are all very important things that you model during your story time, and those are called concepts of print. <laughs> and then finally, the one that we have a tendency to forget but is um, very important is something called pre-writing. And I don't want you guys to panic and think, I mean, to go out and have, you know, get dittos and, or, you know, papers where they have to outline things. Um, what we're trying to do with pre-writing is develop their hand strength and dexterity and control. And we do that through our finger plays. So when you do open shut them, or twinkle twinkle little star, or itsy bitsy spider, and you have them actually doing the finger movements with you, you're developing the hand strength, dexterity, and control. Very important for those young children. Um, anytime you take out a musical instrument, whether it's an egg shaker or your um, uh, 
rhythm sticks or tambourines or triangles or whatever you're using or even clapping your hands. When you do those things, you're actually, again, creating and developing hand strength, dexterity. Um, you're in control, which is very important for a child who is later going to be manipulating pens, pencils, or even typing. And also important is being able to demonstrate writing for them. So showing them um, this is how you write the word. Or if you look in the picture right here, um, I have Sarah, she's reading a book, but if you look immediately to, um, to the right, there's a letter U that she's written. She demonstrated how to write that letter U for those children so they could see um, the control that she used to, in which to do it. So she modeled writing for them. Story time is also an opportunity for us to in, interact in, with our children. So it needs to be entertaining to make it as effective as possible, but by no means are we considered entertainment. Um, children learn through play experiences, and so we want to be as purposeful as we can in our story time and be as an in, interactive, and we want to enhance that learning opportunity by giving them an opportunity to do it themselves. Uh, this is far from a performance. A story time should invite children to help us to tell the story, to learn together, um, to learn from each other, in addition to learning from adults that is not their parents. That's a, a very, um, for a lot of our youngest of children, they may not have had that experience where, um, but they're, you know, talking to another adult who may have different views from them and how do they interact with that person. So we want to make it entertaining where we want them to uh, get up with us and sing and dance and play and tell the story um, and bring up the flannel piece. Um, but we need to make sure that we're very clear in understanding that this is not a performance opportunity, that this is an engagement opportunity. We want to make this a playful learning experience for them. For that reason, can, please consider limiting the size of your early childhood programs um, because this can ensure that they don't get lost in a mob, that there's enough materials for them to play with, that there is enough opportunity for, for them to talk with you. Um, the larger the group, the more difficult it is, especially for our youngest of children, to be able to actively participate in the story. And also it gives us a chance for our parents to kind of um, blend into the background and not be as engaged as we would like them to be also. So we want to make sure that the, there's enough materials for everybody to participate, that we make that eye contact with each of those kids, and they know that they are um, a vital and active part of our story time opportunity. This is also a chance for us to share with our families um, books that we want them to try at home. Uh, that's why our games and our songs are so important. It's not just a way to kind of refocus the kids. It is a way to refocus the kids. But these are things we want them to do in the car or in the grocery store or waiting in line at the DMV or wherever. That these experiences are then um, used in a non-library setting rather than just in a library setting. So that leads into an opportunity to vote, uh, develop social skills. Um, the first three years of life are vital, vital, I can't actually emphasize this enough, to the development of social and uh, emotional well-being. Um, and it has long-range implications. Uh, Janet actually just recently shared with me in June of this year, um, the University of Chicago released a research paper um, where they, and it was called the Foundations for Young Adult Success. So young adults, we're talking, you know, our late tweens and early 20s, what do they need to be successful, right? And it was amazing because in this research study, they talk about early childhood. They talk about the experiences of play and how those, um, those roles play a significant role in developing a, a, an adult later in life. Um, and the four uh, areas that they highlight in the young adult um, frameworks is self-regulation, um, knowledge and skills, mindset and values that those four foundational components need to be in place. Self-regulation, knowledge and skills, mindsets and values. And those all relate back to our earliest of childhood years, especially the self-regulation. There's a time where, our, um, where we're kind of predisposed to learn things at different times. And self-regulation, which is awareness of one's um, our, our emotions, our behaviors, our interactions with others, our paying attention, um, being able to set and achieve goals, Self-regulation actually is a huge part of the um, three to four year age range. So that's right when we have them in our story time, isn't it? Exactly what we want. Uh, and then that also goes back to our Florida Birth of Five standards also state this. If you go to the Florida Birth of Five standards and you look under social, emotional, um, well-being, they're saying, you know, 
are they having um, building positive relationships with familiar adults? And this starts again from our infants, our toddlers, our threes and our fours. Can they build a positive relationship with adults? Can they build a positive relationship with their peers? Can they regulate their behavior and emotions? Ding, 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 what we just said in that report from University of Chicago. Can they demonstrate growing autonomy and independence in daily routine? And can they show confidence and competency in their growing abilities? That is what our Birth to Five standards say of social emotional health. And um, again, that starts from our earliest of children. And you can see how that then relates very nicely into adulthood. And as a matter of fact, many companies, including Google recently, have stated that they're not just looking at a, at a person's academic success, they're looking at their, um, that their extracurricular curricular, and then also their social interactions to determine employability. Because they're saying if an employee cannot uh, communicate effectively with their peers, if they can't work cooperatively, if they can't express their needs and ideas um, in, a, in a positive way, then that is not somebody that they want working for their company. And all of that is stuff that we're working on with our three, fours, and five-year-olds, right? So again, this is very, very important, that social opportunity for our earliest of children. But I also want you to think of this as a social opportunity for our adults as well. A lot of our parents are stay at home, and this is their chance to come out and meet other people, right? So it's a, a great opportunity for our parents to network with each other, to, um, for their kids to network with each other. And so we want to make sure that we're not only having a story time with where this is a, a guided experience, but then we also set up our environment in the library where we want to encourage them to stay and hang out and talk and network with each other there too. Because the story time should not be a time where the parents on their phone or talking to each other. We want them engaged in interacting with their child. So again, they will do these when they leave our, our, our location. When they leave the library, we want them doing these things with us. If they are not engaged in our story time, they're not going to be doing these things with their children. So it's an opportunity for us to set the expectation for our parents too. This is how we want you to socially interact with us. These are expectations of your behavior and our, and our location as well. It's a fantastic way for us to establish routine for school, and um, which is called school readiness. But by no means are we teachers, and I don't, I don't want you to get that. Um, uh, we're not teachers; we're librarians and library staff and support. But we want to make sure that we're establishing this routine for school, um, knowing the alphabet, you know, knowing our beginning sight words, counting. Those are held in high regard with our parents. Where you know, I know you had it where your parents show up and they're like, "My child knows the ABC. Sing it, honey." and then they're singing with you and you're like, okay. And that's great, that's very important, but that does not mean that they're ready for school. Um, the National Association for the Education of Young Children um, released a position paper in 2009 that states school readiness as being physically, cognitively, socially, and emotionally competent, as well as having a positive attitude towards learning. So it's not just do I know my ABCs and one, two, threes, but can I, Am I physically ready? Am I cognitively ready? Can I interact with others? And can I sit and actually interact with somebody else? That is what, and then they have a positive attitude towards learning. I think that is this, truly the definition of our story times, don't you think? We strive to support this. We want our children to be um, interactive with each other and have a learning experience, not just necessarily a school experience. And I know that you had our children, um, our parents, who tell you anecdotes about kids who are, uh, you know, they're ready to start VPK or kindergarten, and then they come to you, and they're like, wow, they just walked right in. They were really comfortable They because you know, they knew what to do. They've been attending your story times. And so they know that in this place, even though it's a longer period of time, they know their comfort level, they know where they are and what they should be doing in that environment. And it's usually our parents who have more of a difficult time with our um, starting school than in our kids. And finally, what is a story time? And it's an opportunity for our parents um, to learn what we're doing and learn about our resources. So we think of our story times really primarily as a little mini training, using their kids as um, little props for us. So we're using the children to demonstrate library resources, library skills, literacy skills uh, for our parents. Um, and it goes back to that social opportunity. If they're engaged and they're participating in our story time, then they're more likely to do this outside of a library setting. So if I only have 30 minutes once a week with a group of kids and their parents, um, I'm going to have impact. Surely I am. 
but if I can have the parents and, and educate them on those activities that they can do in the home, they can do in the grocery store at the doctor's office, it's going to be a much greater impact on the child. So when we're doing our story times, you want to make sure that you're um, sharing these little bit of tidbits. This is not training where I want you to start talking to the parents directly and thinking of it as a training opportunity, but if you chose a book, explain why you chose a book. Or having a take-home sheet that has your reading list based on the theme and maybe an extra song or activity that they can do at home to extend it into the home, those are all great ideas. And then also, you know, feature, not, if you have music in your story time, feature the CDs that it came from. Um, talk about your audio books as great things that they can do in the car ride, um, during the, especially during the summer months. If you have educational toys, don't assume that the parents know how to use them. We found here in Jacksonville that we're having to create programs that um, are really just about the parent and the child playing with the toys that we have available, uh, where we're using it as, a, again, an opportunity to highlight blocks, say, and then we give an example of how to use blocks, and then we give them an opportunity to practice playing with blocks with their child. Um, so we want them to make the most of the experience and, our, and the resources that we have here at the library. Are there any questions about what a story time is? And um, this is Melissa. Go ahead and type your questions into chat um, or raise your hand, and we'll be happy to address those. I know that you guys can hear us. And, and I know you do story times. I know you do. <laughs> and, you know, I think that it's important to, you know, recognize the fact that you do very important jobs when you have story times. And this is just reinforcing, because some people don't think about what they do when they do it. And if you've got young librarians coming into the field and you're training them their first job, it's really important for them to know the mechanics behind, you know, such a simple program as that. We have a question from Natalie who asks, how do you train new staff to do story times? Fantastic question, Natalie. We actually have a, a multi-step internship here um, where they go around and um, they observe other people doing story times. Well, first of all, it starts with me, and I do a, a variation of the, the training I'm doing with you right now, um, which talks about why do we do story times, what is the importance, the research, that, like what Jana said, there is a reason, and, and it's, it's not just a, um, there's an important reason why we do our story times and that we're really fitting a niche into early learning with these young children. And so we really want to emphasize that component first, talk about the research of why we do this, um, and then we will go out and observe other people doing story times um, and have them talk with the, the presenter about how did they choose that theme, how did they find their resources, um, how do they engage the children or talk with the parents. Um, really. Um, walking them through the process of not only planning the story time, but then what does it entail, and then the after, afterwards the um, interactions that you're going to have with everybody. So we start from, as soon as a new staff member comes in, let me tell you what we do and why. Um, and, and we definitely highlight the research, and we highlight the importance in our philosophy of what a story time is, um, so they understand their role in our, in our um, system. Did that answer your question, Natalie? Uh, De Deanna uh, <clears throat> responded, I put out literacy centers for post story time, and Lisa asked, <clears throat> what are literacy centers? Okay, those are, well, fantastic. Thank you for sharing about the literacy centers. Those are uh, wonderful ways of um, highlighting different resources that you have. So what a literacy center is, um, or at least in, in my interpretation, it's little um, centers that you have or stations, I guess another way of saying it, little stations that you have pre-story time um, that have a purpose. So, uh, for example, you could have um, something that we'll do is we'll have blocks available and then we'll have a whole bunch of construction books together over by the blocks to encourage them to build but then also read the books and maybe get them for inspiration. Or if it's something according to the theme, um, maybe we're talking about ducks today, we'll have um, feathers and, and uh, little ducks over there for them to play with and interact with that help extend the experience. So it's having little stations around your, your 
library that either enhance the theme of the story time or enhance um, an interaction that you want to have with the parent. We have a, another question. What's the best way to deal with large groups of babies and toddlers? I have groups of 30 to 40 babies and 60 to 70 toddlers. I do a lot of music and movement. I can only do one story and I have an iPad and a projector. Right. Um, my, the way I would um, approach that is doing two back to back because those, what you have right there between 30, I, I don't recommend any more than like 10 to 15 infants in a story time um, with, their, with their parent, of course. And then also, you know, about 15 to 20 toddlers in a story time only because, because of mob mentality with the toddlers, they get out of control. Yeah. So if your library allows it to be able to do two back-to-back -back story times um, where you can limit the number that come in each, at, at each, I would recommend that. If not, potentially adding another story time in your week for your parents. Um, the frequency is very important. So if you have uh, limiting the number that can come in, but then having extension activities, we talked about those centers are very important so that you're not turning a parent away per se. Um, if they can't come in that first time, or they have to come back later in the week, whatever you choose to do, that they still have an experience that they can do with their child, and that's a guided experience. That's what's important. Because you're right, doing the songs, doing the musical instruments, that's all important, but if you're counteracting mob mentality, um, that's a very difficult thing to uh, go up against. Nancy has mentioned... Um, we like the idea of headphones, groups for parents and children hearing in their own group. I'm sorry, can you repeat that again? I didn't hear that very well. Um, uh, Nancy writes, we hear you, like the idea of headphones groups and parents and children <laughs> hearing in their own group. Like having, at, like afterwards? I guess. Uh, Nancy, can you clarify your question? Yes. We move on to the next one. How do you manage? The answer, Nancy says yes for after. Okay, okay, great. And I'm, I'm sorry I couldn't address that. Um, we have another Any question. Okay. Lisa writes, how do you manage parents talking ah, during toddler question. story time? Absolutely. Um, well, what we do, especially in our toddler story time, um, I give the toddlers or the children, depending, it doesn't matter the age, um, something that they have to do with their parents. So if we're, um, if we're singing a song, um, then they have to, I, for example, if we're doing row, row, row your boat, I will have the child holding the parent's hands and they've got to row, row, row back, your boat back and forth with each other. Or if we're um, doing um, a musical instrument, I may actually, give out the musical instrument to the parent, not the child first, so then it forces the parent, they'll turn around and give it right back to the child, but you're engaging the parent and letting them know they're an active part of this um, as well. Or I'll say, hey, kids, I have a question for you. Ask your adult this question. And so then the kids will turn around and ask their parent, and the parent has to answer the question. So it's just a way of letting the parent know that they have an active role to play in this as well and using the child as a way as a go-between is what I do so I give the child an action to do that involves their parent um, this is Jana one of the things I used to do when I had talkative parents during story time is I would put the lay the book down in my lap and stop talking and just sit there and smile and after a couple of seconds parents start to realize there's nothing going on in the front so they stop talking okay. And then right. I'll say, thank you for not talking, and then I'll continue. So it's, you know. Right. Absolutely. And, and another thing we do is setting, we don't have rules of story time, but we do set, have story time expectations. And one of the things we do in our story time expectation is we state for our parents that this is a, a program for everybody, and we, and we expect and would like all participants um, to be involved in our story time. So you're setting it right from the beginning. Um, and then if you have to call out a parent, because that happens every now and again, if you have to call out a parent, at least you've set and established um, the expectation before you even started story time. You know, turn off your cell phones. We're going to be doing a lot of singing, dancing. We'll even say it comedically, like, yeah, I'm going to be singing up here. And believe me, you don't want me singing by myself, so let's make sure everybody's singing with me. So you're setting that what you want the parents to do before you even start the program. 
We have a comment from Andy. I'd like to include some stats related to our community regarding literacy, education rates, and connection to poverty levels, incomes. The goal being to pull in stats from various stages to give a more encompassing view of the cradle to career continuum and how it all connects and is relevant. I think this would be good information to include when talking to possible supporters and giving elevator speeches to various community groups. You mentioned some in your presentation, and I'm wondering if you have additional suggestions of other good sources. Um, yes, and actually we're gonna, that's what's next is, um, I have a, a whole list of resources that I would recommend uh, becoming familiar with um, and, and sitting down with your, with your library and talking about what points do you want to emphasize, because there's a lot out there. So there are statistics on anything that you're looking for, and depending on, um, on what, what your, your library's focus is, I would choose that research to support you, and then maybe even create a little brochure or a little bookmark or something that highlights those things that you can use as an elevator speech, and then also give them a, a little handout. And I'd make it fun and cute, and you know, because um, you don't want to come across as preachy either. Uh, but yeah, I'm about to share with a, quite a few resources that I recommend. Um, but I would sit down and talk with your library about which area do you want to focus on first. Um, because it can come across as overwhelming, which on the one hand is good because you're like, look at all we're doing, but then after a while people can tune out because they're like, this is too much and I can't process this information. So, you know, look through and, and highlight a couple things that you really want to focus and feature and then create a, a quick visual, um, uh, and I would, like I said, a little bookmark or something that you can um, distribute to help prove your point. Uh, one of the things, and it, this is Jana again, uh, in addition to what Susan's going to tell you, um, if you could sign up for next week's webinar, which is um, Family Literacy and School Readiness with Evan St. Leifer, who works for, uh, he's one of the vice presidents of Scholastic, and he's very passionate about family literacy, and he kind of is not doing the same thing as Susan. He is, but mm -hmm. he's doing it from a higher level. Um, looking right. down on statistics nationwide, those kinds of things. So um, they and Evan State Lifer is incredible. He he really is. He's um, a very dynamic speaker, and and he will he, yeah he's going to come this information from a different perspective because he's coming from a community perspective. Right. And that actually might help you as well. Yeah. We do have another question. Any comments on crafts slash exploratory activities? Do them. <laughs> Absolutely, um, especially when you're doing art activities with uh, with children, and or you're doing like um, basic uh, steam activities with kids, um, and we can do that as young as 18 months, two years with our youngest of children. Um, when you're doing art activities with them, not only are you creating that experiential learning, so you're doing the neural pathways, uh, but it's a big one for pre-writing because if they're having to manipulate the um, scissors, or they're having to uh, use their fingers for finger paint, or if they're, you know, using tongs for picking something up, um, you're developing that hand strength. Um, but then they're also comprehending as a direct action, so their, mem their memory is being enhanced, so now you're doing a comprehension activity. Uh, so there's, um, yes, I would absolutely recommend doing art activities with kids, and remember with our youngest of children, it's not so much, can you put this star here on this piece of paper? that if crafts have a place, but for our youngest of children, they're just trying to explore the materials themselves. So set up the environment for them, but um, expect that they may not necessarily use it how you would like them to use it, and that's okay, because they're not used to these materials, and so they need to explore what these materials are. And one of the things that we say to our parents is, not everything is refrigerator worthy. Not everything that you make with us today is gonna go home and be on the refrigerator, um, because it, it's, a practice for them, not necessarily a result for them. Uh, where when we get to school age, a craft is very important because there's the steps that are involved and they have the capacity to be able to complete it from beginning to end and they feel success when they're done. With our youngest of children or four and under, that success is just the fact that they were able to experience um, the either the science activity or the art activity. We have a couple more questions here. Um, okay. What about a situation where there is more than one child per caregiver? Um, we actually do welcome that. I know that you know if there's twins or um, an older sibling with a younger sibling, um, 
it depends on the program and what we say, like if it's, if it's going in for a, a lapsit program like a Stories for Babies and there's a, a, an older child that's with them, we are very clear to the parent that if there is an opportunity for them to go to one of our all-inclusive story times, we encourage that. But if not, they need to know that for their three-year-old, um, this might be something that's not, that they, um, it's really intended for the child, like the infant. So the infant is going to get more out of the experience and just informing that parent of, of the purpose because then it goes back to there's a reason I'm doing the story time and I am the expert in this field and the story time is intended for your infant, not your three-year-old. However, they're welcome because they're always welcome, but they may be easily distracted or bored. I'm just informing you of that. However, I have this other story time opportunity for you that your whole family can encourage or encouraged to participate. So um, we... I, I think it's very exclusory if we say you can only come in with one child at a time. And sometimes our parents um, are working parents, and so having mom and dad there at the same time, or grandma and mom there, is, it's a it's a, a dip, it's a additional taxing thing that we're asking our parents to, to do. Now that, that being said, we definitely need to make sure then that they really are engaged and in interacting in our story time. And I think making that clear that while I see you have an infant, I see you have a three-year-old, we want to make sure that you're still very much actively a part of our story time so you can make the best of the situation for all of your children. Okay, and um, it looks like we're getting close to the time, Susan. So if we want to just get through the rest of it and then we can hold the questions and get to those and then stay on it and answer everybody's questions after. Absolutely, and I, I will be happy to answer anybody's questions afterwards as well. Yes. Okay, so the, the I do have a, re, a, I guess we'll move on to the next slide, which is what does this mean? Um, and that means uh, making the most of your story time is making sure that you're talking, singing, reading, writing, and playing with them, which is straight out of the, you know, every child ready to read at your library from ALA. So asking um, our parents, to see how you're talking with their children, singing with their children, reading, writing, and playing with their children, giving them specific strategies for them to do in their home um, and in, in a non-library setting are very, very important. Yeah, okay. And then finally, resources that I have available to address those. Uh, I, I've, um, I've, all of this uh, information that I've shared today is actually, um, I found from here, and, and again, this is not exhaustive, um, and some of these are additionally more, but the early catastrophe, the 30 million word gap, that's the, um, that's the actual position paper. If you would like to read for yourself what, what the researchers did and, and how, they, um, how this information was uh, gathered. Also, I have ALA's Every Child Ready to Read at Your Library is a good informational resource because they, again, have a lot of research for you. I would recommend um, seeing if your local library cooperative has a copy first before you decide to purchase, um, just to kind of look through, see what kind of information you would and would not, you know, what you would like to use. And then we said they did just release um, fantastic ALA, the new uh, brochures and posters and um, handouts uh, that give specific strategies for parents and it's based on nursery rhymes. It's actually really adorable and I, I do recommend looking further into that. ALSC has uh, competencies for libraries uh, serving children in public libraries and that starts from our youngest children all the way up to 18. So I would say take a look at that and see, um, especially for we were talking about new staff and they want to know what is their role in our library. This is a fantastic way to introduce that. This is what, you know, our, uh, our library association says this is what libraries should be doing and it kind of just helps set the tone for them of what their role is in our library. I absolutely hands down recommend please checking out Center on the Developing Child through Harvard. They have a whole series called In Brief, uh, which is a YouTube web series um, with very quick three to five minute videos that talk a lot about child development and, um, and just very informative and, and such good information and I, I can't recommend that one enough. Uh, Florida Birth of Five Early Learning Standards. I did mention those earlier. I know standards are for teachers, but they're fantastic for us because if we don't know what the what a two-year-old can do versus a four-year-old versus an 18-month-old, um, I can go here and say, okay, I need to work on, what, Susan says work on social emotional skills. All right, fine, what does that mean? Well, here they'll actually break it down for you to say, well, this is what a child at this age um, should be working towards, and here are strategies for, um, for accomplishing that. So there's our four to birth the five learning standards. NACI, which is the National Association for the Education of Young Children, 
wealth of informa information. In November, they're actually going to be in Orlando for their national conference. If you get a chance to attend, it's awesome. Um, just a, a fantastic resource. But that is where I got the information on school readiness. And like I said, what we take as the definition for school readiness, not just um, knowing our IBCs, but that we know that we're physically, emotionally, cognitively, um, and uh, developmentally ready to start and have a good attitude towards learning. The National Institute for Literacy has, a, a, again, a paper called Early Beginnings, which is early literacy knowledge and instruction that gives examples of what early literacy is and how you can incorporate that in your story time. Reading Rocket's website is a fantastic resource for practical ideas for sharing with parents and also doing with kids in your story time. And then if you want to learn more about that Wake Forest uh, research, this Science Daily Turn Off TV to Teach Toddlers New Words, that's a great summary paper on that 2007 Wake Forest research um, that uh, resulted in Disney pulling Baby Einstein videos. So there you have it. Again, my name is Susan Mankowski. Um, my contact information is here. I will stay on to see if I can answer anybody's questions, but if you would like to contact me personally, here is my, um, my telephone number and my email address. Please feel free to contact me, and I would be happy to share any other resources or strategies that I have. Um, thank you so much, Susan. This is Jana. Um, all the resources that you mentioned, plus others, will be up on our, our um, Florida Library Youth Program uh, webpage that will have begin hopefully in August to have links and activities for parents and caregivers and professionals that they can go to that are called from local and national sources for early literacy and school readiness so that we can pull um, like a clearinghouse so that we have something additional that can help. Right. And this is Patrick, um, and I'd like to encourage everyone to complete the survey you'll be receiving. You're going to get an email, which includes a recording of today's webinar, which I encourage you to uh, promote and share with your colleagues, and that will include a link to our survey. Uh, we value your feedback. So um, uh, any ideas uh, for future webinars, um, any suggestions uh, for, our, for, our, for our webinar program, I would love to hear. Thank you very much for attending, everyone. And we've got some questions to keep answering. Um, OK. Let's see here. Which ones haven't we answered yet? The, the. Yeah. OK. Uh, what do you suggest for when a child is disruptive and has a meltdown? Oh, that's a good one, because that does happen from time to time, doesn't it? Um, I think sometimes parents get confused as to when they're in your environment, who's supposed to take care and handle a situation like that. And we always want to go back and encourage the parent. Now, initially, sometimes kids are, you know, we're in the middle of nap time or they're hungry or whatever. So trying to be as um, understanding of that as possible and ignore as much of the behavior as possible is, uh, is helpful. Um, so if you can, um, you know, start a song. It, it's amazing how music really does calm the savage beast. Like if you can break into song um, as, soon, as soon as possible, obviously if you're in the middle of the book, you're not going to stop reading the book to break into song, but ignore the behavior as much as possible and then try to do something that refocuses the child and is a comforting, soothing thing and so, um, songs have a tendency to do that. Another thing that you can do is to address at the beginning of your story time like we did um, earlier with parent participation. Well, parent participation is also knowing when your child is um, borderline not able to participate any longer. Um, and so what we do at the beginning of our story time is say, you know, if your child would rather be on the playground rather than in story time today, that's okay. Go ahead and step out, um, you know, if you feel the need and we'll see you next week. So we state it at the beginning and the expectation for parents that we know sometimes you're going to have a rough day. It's going to happen. Um, but if you see that your child is not happy and this is not the place for them, we want to make this a, a environment that joyful and positive, and so don't force them to stay here. Um, but I would not stop the story time to address it unless it's like really out of control. Um, but I also say having a meltdown is one thing. We do have kids who just can't sit still and will walk around or run around, and as long as they're not a fight risk and they're not being um, a danger to themselves or somebody else, we ignore that behavior. 
because uh, sometimes toddlers have to move. They have the gift of movement. They need to move. So we ignore that behavior that's not considered something um, of a meltdown. But if they're truly losing it, um, again, just a general reminder to the parents that it's okay. We'll see you next week. We have a comment from Deanna. Uh, you can remind parents of their roles in housekeeping beforehand. Absolutely. Everything. And that and that includes turning your cell phones off. That you know we expect everybody to participate. If your child's not happy, um, you know we'll see you next week. And also another one, the one that we include um, that I definitely recommend is no eating or drinking during story time because that is the ultimate distraction. And there's no way you can compete with food and and, and drinking. There is not. And it's a 30 minute program, so it's not like you're starving the child or withholding food from them, but unless they're, you know, a nursing mom, that's completely different. But if you have a three year old who wants a snack in the middle of story time, you're going to have a whole group of kids who are like, well, I want snack too. And there's no way you can compete with that. So um, we do ask that, you know, food and drink are, are not during our story time. Well, it also depends on if you have um, uh, your, your maintenance staff get after you about that as well. That is true. Because that is true. It, it, yeah, and that does go back to whether your library uh, allows that into the library right. as well. Right. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to, to comment on, one of the comments earlier about the headphones afterward, mm -hmm. if they have yeah, I, stations, you know, and they have parents that want to get together with their children as a little group and share, that's perfectly fine. But today, I don't think that those listening stations really exist anymore, do they? I'm sorry, that's what I did not realize that's what they were referring to. Yes, um, listening stations are great, but yeah, I, I'm not sure how many people are actually doing But that's a great way for you to have your audiobooks ready if you want to recreate and have your um, listening stations yeah. available. That is a fantastic way of highlighting your, um, your audiobook selection and your music selection as well. Or if they have um, uh, other extra iPads they could put off in the corner of a room, Absolutely. Have a group of children, you know, listen to a story together afterwards. Right. Right. And just getting a couple of uh, splitters um, so that multiple headphones. We have another question oh, yeah. from Michelle. Okay. Uh, what if the wandering around becomes such that it turns others off from attending? Is it for the greatest good? What can we be done about the one? Oh, that's fantastic. That's a good question. And I do think it comes back to understanding. It depends on the age of the child. So if you have an older child who is, it, it, it's two things. It depends on the age of the child and how often are they attending. So if it's a child that's their first time in your story time, oh my gosh, you're just overwhelmed. Like they want to see what's going on. They're, they want to, they're, you're actually not even a part of the equation that first story time because they're looking at other kids, they're looking at other parents, they're looking at your room and your flannels and everything else but you. So if, um, oh, two years or less and are attending every week, if they're two years or less, that's, um, I think it's sharing with the other parents um, as long as they're not being a, a, a um, I know that they're a distraction for the parent, but if they're not being a, a, a harmful to themselves or another child, um, and again, or a flight risk, at that age, that is very developmentally appropriate. And I think it potentially sharing that information with that parent, that while you understand it can be a, a potential distraction, um, and that actually that is what a child of that age may do. And it's not that they're not paying attention to what's going on. That is actually how they're processing the story time. That is how they're actually engaging and acting on the story time at that at that stage in their life. Now, what you can do is ask the parent if they could please, um, of the child who's running around, if they could please kind of sit towards the back of this, uh, that you know that he's a mover and shaker and you're so excited that they're there, but for his benefit, if, or if they could kind of sit towards the back of the room, that might actually help them be less of a distraction for a parent um, who uh, sees this child running around. Is that helpful, Michelle? Okay, anybody else? Story time, which was kind of, okay. you know, it's going in front of the books, right in front of everybody. Um, and, you know, you can't say, honey, you're a window, not you're a door, not a window. But, um, you know, you have to say, sit right here, sit right here, sit right in front so you can help, you know, and, and there are ways that you can deal right. with that. I would also have, 
uh, honestly, Michelle, um, thank you for bringing that up, Jana. Um, if that's the case, and they're like, right, they're actually up front because. That's a completely different experience. This is a child who's hyper engaged in what you're doing, and so that's a um, that's a different problem to have because you don't want to then discourage that child from participating. But what you can do, and this is actually helpful for a lot of children too and under, and again, and knowing um, developmentally where a child is, they they might be older and never been in a story time either. Have a like a stash of books off to the side that if a child comes up and is really engaged or, or moving around, give them the book to hold themselves. And it doesn't have to be the book that you're reading. It just has to be a book. And it, hopefully along the same theme, they actually focus their attention a lot longer um, if, they are, um, if they have something to hold in their hands. So if you're trying to read a book and the child is running around or right up in your face and wanting to take the book themselves or sit on your lap or take the flannel piece or whatever, have a stash of books available that you can just say, oh, are you interested? Here you go, and give them that book too. That's a way to also um, distract, but then also you're, uh, you're, you know the needs of the child and you're trying to accommodate them. We have a couple other uh, comments. Be mindful of neurodiversities. And we have experienced more of a competitive situation that is, who can be the closest? Yes, yes. And I do definitely be very hyper aware of neurodiversity, that is true. Um, just because we have you know, milestones of development does not mean that we all progress along the same at the same rate. Um, and so being very hyper aware of that. Um, and the competitive situation of who can be the closest, uh, if you can have them make um, the, the couple things that you can do with that is, uh, again, sitting beforehand, if you have like the sit-upon little pillows or a carpet square or something, you're trying to help them or even have like tape on the ground where they where they sit or sit within a specific space. Um, they're not very good at their own space awareness and, and you know, their, their needs are a priority over everybody else and they don't see why anyone else is complaining because I can see, why can't you? So if, if they have their own little space that is theirs, whether it's, like I said, a pillow or a carpet square or um, if you have a line of tape or, you know, like a semicircle of tape that they all sit on, then it kind of defines the space more for them and it's very helpful. That's also good for a child who's a wanderer because uh, even though there's not a physical barrier, for some reason that is a barrier for them and they will stay within the space that you need them to. We have a comment from Cami. You may want to draw a circle, real or imaginary, to sit outside of. Ah, that's true. There you go. Yeah. Um, and and like I said, um, painter's tape is fantastic, and it doesn't leave residue on the carpet. Right. We found that out the hard way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is yeah, Patrick. tape that leaves residue on carpet is not great. Oh, this is Patrick, and I have a question. What, what are neurodiversities? Neurodiversities are um, um, children that develop at different rates. So, for example, a, a child on the autism spectrum would be a, a, a somebody to, um, they may have a different way that they're interacting with their environment um, or need more of, um, a, they may need a different sensory experience. So understanding that or a child with, uh, a lot of childs with special needs, uh, they need to interact with their environment in a different way. And so knowing that and being aware of that, um, a lot of our parents with children with special needs will not attend story time because they're hyper aware of and know that their children may not interact the way that we would like them to, but those are the kids who really need it the most. So being aware of it, and it's not like having parents tell us if their child has special needs or not, but just we need to be aware of um, how to make the environment accommodating for them um, and welcoming for everybody. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So are there any more questions? I think we've answered all the everything that's come in so far. And those of you that are still on with us, you guys are troopers. Thanks for um, for sticking around. No and kidding. Su Susan, you're awesome. Thank you, you for awesome. um, fixing your the audio issues and um, and giving us yeah. so much great information. And we hope that you'll come Thank back you. and do something for us again. That sounds good. We'll work on that definitely. And if all of you that are Thank still Thank you, listening, everybody. Thank you. Um, those of you who are still listening, if you have ideas for what Susan can talk about, that would be fabulous as well. Be sure to put that on the survey that you'll get. Yes, please. And this is Patrick. One more plug for the survey. You'll be getting a, a uh, link to the recording for this webinar as well as um, a survey, and we value your feedback. I encourage you to complete it. Thank you. <laughs>